Um, so I, I might talk about like adapter signatures and a, a improvement on what you could do with HDLCs. Oh yeah, I can I can quick so so you know the general structure. I don't I everyone draws it differently. Like it's sort of more versus mealy machine. I like more machines with some. Um, so so I think of like the UTXOs as like where bitcoins live, and you've got like a funding transaction which creates this uh, funding TXO, and that's got a two of two multisig on it, um, and then you create all these commitment transactions which have a bunch of outputs on them, right? And then you've got your like output set, uh, and so it's you know Alice's coins, Bob's coins. And depending on whether it's Alice or Bob broadcasting this transaction, one of them's got like a uh, time lock on it, and one of them doesn't. Uh, and then you can add as many HTLCs as you want. Um, well, no, you have Linux, but you can add a bunch of HTLCs here. Um, but the HTLCs are, you know, they have their own hash H associated with them. Um, and the problem, so I guess one of the issues, so, so going back, I sort of, should introduce, like, I worked on Lightning a long time ago before and I made up the name Lightning Network and all that stuff. Like, uh, so it, it started with, like, Joseph and I working on this stuff in San Francisco a long time ago. Um, and the idea of HDLCs was Joseph's. Like, he, the, the, the thing that I was like, oh, that's a good idea, was using hashes and pre-images instead of all the signatures. Because generally in Bitcoin, the idea of using pre-images is like, no, we have legit cryptography here with like signatures and like that, you know, hashes and pre-images doesn't, it is a commitment to data, but it's not, it didn't seem useful, right? Um, because, well, yeah, I can provide a pre-image, but anyone can provide a pre-image. Um, but the idea of like, no, we're going to make these payments based on pre-images as well as uh, signatures. Uh, I thought that was a big idea. I was like, oh, cool. So um, that's interesting. It's got downsides, right? So there's a bazillion downsides. I'm sure you've seen over the last two days, two and a half, uh, of all the things in Lightning. Um, but one of the downsides with HTLCs is that they are linkable. And so privacy is like, a lot of times people would ask, like, okay, is privacy, you know, Bit Lightning helps privacy. It's like, I guess kind of probably doesn't make it worse. It could in some cases. Like, it's, it's not clear. <laughs> um, and one thing in HTLCs is they are linkable, right? They all have the same hash. So if you're able to view on the network, right? So here's Alice, Bob, Carol, Dave. Um, the same hash is going going into all these HTLC, going to all these uh, commitment transactions, and so you can try to link things. If if you are the recipient and you provide a hash H, and then you see something close here, you know the path. Or you know that that was in the path. You're like, oh, huh, that that channel that just closed was in the path. If you somehow get access to some of the data going through the network, if you see your hash, you're like, you know what it is. So it's it's unique, but it's unique to the whole path. It would be cool if you could somehow make something where the hash is changed. But just having the hashes change for each hop doesn't work, right? Because if you close one, the whole idea is that like, hey. Knowledge, the payment is contingent on knowledge of this pre-image. And the pre-image sort of flows backwards, right? So you obviously know this stuff, but you know, add, 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 reveal, remove, remove, remove. Um, and as that, you know, R value, the, the random value propagates backwards, everyone sort of gets the money. Um, so it'd be cool if you had different H's and different R's, but then that sort of breaks the entire chain. So I there are ways to do it that we haven't implemented and are somewhat complicated, but I thought I could talk about that because the HTLC part has probably uh, already been covered. So have you gone over Schnorr signatures at all or ECDSA at all? Okay, so yeah. So did, a little, so I, I can explain some of that stuff. Um, and then I might be back, like, so I might be back later to talk about uh, discrete log contracts. And I should say the thing, I, so it's a little weird. I haven't actually been working on Lightning for like almost a year um, because I've been working on this other thing called U3XO, which is an accumulator and a completely different thing. Um, but it's still, you know, Bitcoin, scalability, stuff like that. Um, so, so some of the things I'm a little, like I haven't even kept up with. I'm like, wait, what's a trampoline thing? Like, I've, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, 
So, yeah. Um, and so I might talk about discrete log contracts, which is much more related to Lightning uh, later, um, and uses Schnorr signatures. And so I'll just, so to start, ECDSA is the signature system uh, everyone uses in Bitcoins. Uh, it uses this elliptic curve, which looks like the, it doesn't really, but you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, you got this curve, which is of the four. I mean, these, this isn't really something you need to know, but it's like x squared equals y cubed or a y cubed plus, or wait, no, sorry. Y squared equals some coefficient x cubed plus some coefficient x squared plus some constant. Uh, in Bitcoin, B is. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. In B zero, in Bitcoin B zero. In the in Bitcoin, in Bitcoin, it's seven, and it's just one. A is like one, right? Yeah. So it's. So it, yeah, I, yeah, sorry. Right. I, I thought this was squared because B is zero anyway, so I don't remember this. But yeah, in Bitcoin, it's just this, and you get some curve. Um, you don't really need to know how the curve works. The, the curve operation, there's only addition defined on this group. So the idea, well, it's group. So the idea is if you have some point A and some point B, um, you draw a line and, wait, well, no, that's a tangent, sorry. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> you can draw it right. If so, a counts twice in this line I just drew because it's a tangent. Sorry. Um, so that that's that's doubling a. If you draw a over here, then it would be like this, and then you have some point where it intersects. Um, and then you say that like a plus b plus c equals zero. So then a, if you want to find the sum of a plus b, then it's the negation here. If it, so if it's a tangent, then it only intersects in two lines. Right, so, so if, if, if you did that tangent, then, then a, 2a would be down here. Anyway, you don't really need, like, I don't think you can do anything fancy with the fact that this curve has this, like, two-dimensional representation that you can look at. Because in practice, it's all modulo some big number, and it looks like dots. Uh, it still has the symmetri symmetry properties. Um, but basically what you need to know, in, in the notation, we usually use lowercase letters to mean scalars, right? So A is a scalar, which is just a regular number. Um, and in Bitcoin or in the computer, it's generally a 32-byte number, right? So you got 32, 32 array, and you're like, cool, that's my scalar. Um, and then usually we use big numbers to be a point. Um, and the point on the curve, the curve has an x and y coordinate, and usually we use 32 bytes for each. Um, so it's sort of twice as big. It, in the naive way, you say, okay, well, my x coordinate is just going to be, you know, like an array of two 32 byte integers, right? Um, but you can do a lot better. So I don't know if you've talked about like Bitcoin's, gen like, wait. When did you guys start? <laughs> like Monday or like weeks ago? Two weeks ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure, right, yeah. So I mean, probably, presumably you're interested in this Bitcoin stuff and so you've learned about it. Um, but so if you've, I, but I don't know, like every, probably everyone's got totally different background in terms of like math and programming and all these things. Um, so if you're more familiar with like, okay, here are the bytes and bits in Bitcoin, um, the signatures and the pub keys in Bitcoin, they always start with like an 03. Well, no, they can start with 02 or 03 or 04 or, right. So 03, 02 and 03 mean I'm going to be compressed. Um, and then 04 and the other are uncompressed. Um, so uncompressed is... I'm going to represent, I'm going to have like two 32 byte things for the x and y coordinate. And compressed means, well, since this is symmetrical over the x axis, I'm just going to tell you the x coordinate and then give you a single bit for the y plus or minus. And then you can figure out the y coordinate yourself from the curve equation. Um, so compressed is nice because you save 32 bytes. Um, 
ish, 31 and a 7 eighths bytes. Um, but you then have to do a little bit of work to figure out what the y coordinate was. So you can then, generally in RAM, you're going to have this. So you can do your curve, you know, your addition equations. Um, but you don't really have to know that it's a curve. You just say, okay, I've got scalars and I've got points. And the operations that we can do, with scalars, you can do whatever you want, right? These are just regular numbers. So a plus b, no problem. a times b, no problem. a divided by b. You can do whatever you want. They're numbers, right? Exponentiate. You can it's easy. Points, on the other hand, you can add. You can get it. You can take two points and draw a line and add them. Um, you cannot multiply, right? So it's just not defined. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, what does it mean to have b times a? Like eh, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Um, so that's really useful, right? You. You. But now. You've got this sort of limited operation you can do here. Here you can do whatever you want. However, you can, I like to think of like, jump into the dark world of points by point multiplication. So you can say a scalar times a point, and that will give you a other point. So this is really cool. Uh, you can actually do division, sort of. You take the multiplicative in first. We never really do that. Um, what is that? Yeah. Okay. Another <laughs> another thing. So yeah. So there's ECDSA, which is not great, and then there's this thing called Schnorr, which I shouldn't even call it Schnorr, because there's this guy Klaus Schnorr, and he came up with this equation, um, but he patented it, and so no one could use it basically, because uh, patents are sort of like toxic weight. Like there's stuff. It's patented, and you're just like, fine. I don't want to read any pa paper about patents because then I just can't use it. It's just like keys. Um, so Schnorr is a, a much better equation. It makes sense. There's like proofs. I can. That's what I'm going to talk about. ECDSA is basically people checking with lawyers, being like, okay, we changed the equation. Is this not infringing? And they're like, mm, no, it's still too close. Okay, we added this other thing. Is this good? And they're like, mm, still too close. And they're like, okay, we did multiplicative inverse, like. Change these things, and they're like, "Yeah, okay, that's different enough that you can use it, and it doesn't infringe on this patent." And we, yeah, we don't. We we assume it's still similar enough that it works, but it's different enough that the lawyers say it's okay. A lawyer will. The only answer a lawyer will ever give you is, "It depends." Uh, so <laughs> you can pay them as much as you want. Uh, I think it's just. Yeah, they just don't want to. They don't want to cryptographically commit to anything. Like, well, it depends. You might be okay with that. Yeah. So, lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not non non. It's repudiable proof of lawyer. The lawyers aren't even going to put their name on it. But yeah. So, ECDSA does have some weird operations that make it really hard to do fun things with. Um, and so, I'll talk about get to the Schnorr equation because it's actually not that hard. Um, Compared to ECDSA, where I, I sort of started and looked at, you know, looked at all the Bitcoin stuff and looked how the ECDSA worked. I'm like, I don't know this stuff. Like, I'll work on other things. Um, but then once you look at Schnorr, you're like, wait, this makes sense. This is not like complicated math, really. Um, you just have to sort of know these different operations you can do. Um, and then once you understand Schnorr, you can go to ECDSA and be like, oh, okay, I see how they got here. Um, but okay, so so. These are the operations you can do. This is an important operation, right? You can take any scalar, multiply it by any point, and you get another point. What that means is it's a, dub it's a repeated doubling operation. So you can do addition, right? And you can do addition of the same thing. So you can say a plus a equals b or whatever. And that's on that curve thing. You take a tangent, and you find where it intersects, and then you drop down, and you say, OK, this is, if this is a, this is 2a. Um, and that's, um, so that's, you can do that. And so the way you, you get a scalar multiplication is you say, okay, well, I'm just going to keep doubling, right? So if I say, okay, this is 2a, now take the tangent here, and this is uh, going to be 4a, right? And then I take a tangent over here, and this is going to be 8a. And then, you know, I keep jumping around on this curve by taking tangents, and I can get 2, 4, 8, 16, all the powers of 2 I want. And then, now that I've got this, well, I only need like 256 different powers of 2, and I can store all those. That's not going to take too much space. And then when I 
um, want to compute any given scalar times b, I just do, you know, okay, which bits are set here and add all those points. Um, so this is pretty quick, especially if you pre-compute. If there's a point that you're going to be using a lot, you pre-compute all the powers of two multiples, you know, the, the two of it, so four of it, eight of it, and then you like store those on disk somewhere, and then you can just look them up really quick and add on average, you know, an expectation you're going to add 128 of those points, and not too, not too fat, uh, slow. So generally on the curve, we pick a point called G, and G is just some generator. It should be, it should work. Since these, uh, since these groups are, like, the one in Bitcoin is prime order, there's nothing weird to worry about. Basically, G is just some arbitrary point. But it's called a generator because you can get to any point on it by doing this operation some number of times. Then you'll, like, loop back to G. Um, now, wait, what was I saying? The, hold on, so the generator point, oh yeah, there's some weird stuff about the generator point that we don't really know. So Satoshi picked uh, sec p 256 k one which has a fairly simple equation, that's cool. It doesn't look sketchy, because you're like, oh, x cubed plus seven, Where, what can you do with that that's sketchy? But there are some weird things about it still. Um, like, like, what is it, two, the, the x coordinate for, 2G or something is like really low or something weird like that. There was a paper a year ago where they found something like that definitely is not random about G, but nobody knows who picked it. So, the stack overflow answer where, uh, like, I think Greg Maxwell speculated that like the, the x coordinate was like a name hash times two or something like that, so that's where maybe it came. Yeah, there, I, I, I should look it up, but I, it, there's things, so G is supposed to be just an arbitrary point. It doesn't seem like it's quite arbitrary in this case, but probably it's still okay. As long as no one knows what, you, what you'd even know, right? Like there's no discrete log of G with respect to what, right? So it's, it's fine. It's completely random. You can pick any point on this curve. Right, right. You it's can, literary. and it should work, right? Yeah, so even if I pick someone where... It's like, weird. It, then let's assume I look at the bits of this point, and this is my name because I just loved it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's should be fine. why it was chosen. Right. Like, I mean, it's not in this case, right? But so, so it's really yeah. completely arbitrary. And random. Yeah. So, so I think, but but there is evidence that like G isn't. There is yeah, some weird name the thing. Why they chose it, but yeah, but it's fine. It's fine. It should be fine. It's just a little no, scary. It is. It is. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Any point in this group can can be a generator. Right. It's just the order of all the other points change, but well. Yeah. Maybe not the zero or y equals zero point. That okay, yeah, so. Be a bit degenerate. We'll wait. Okay, <coughs> there's. The the then, then there's like a point here and then. Of two generators. Okay, so. I, have any relationship. Yeah, so there's a lot of little things. So, like, if you take the point here and then the tangent just goes up and never intersects again, and, but then you say it intersects at the point in infinity, and there's like things like this, but we. You should put it in the code, because you never know, but a lot of the things in the code are like, well, if this happens, do this, but the this happens is a 1 in 2 to the 256 chance-ish. So Unit testing framework for SecP256 is... Right. There's a lot of tests. <laughs> Don't test it. It never happens. Right, right. So, so there's a lot of things where like, well, you know, there's, there exists this point and stuff, but it's like, you're not going to hit it. Um, it's sort of like, maybe you're going to find a... Maybe there is a block in Bitcoin for which there can be no hash, with, which like you know satisfies the the target. It's possible. It's so unlikely that we don't worry. Okay, so so there's all these. So you get the general idea of how to um, how to multiply. This is called a scalar scalar point multiplication, right? So a scalar and a point you multiply, you get another point. Um, you can't divide, since you can't multiply points, you can't divide points. So the result of this C, you can't, given C, you're like, I want to get back to A. I know C, I know B, I want to do some function of C and B where I get back to A. That's supposedly not possible. I mean, there's, there's ways, you know, Pollard's row or I don't know what, but the idea is this is hard. You cannot efficiently compute given C and B. And you know there's some factor, right? If you multiply B by some number, you're going to get to C. But what is it? Uh, so this is the discrete log problem. Um, this is called the discrete log problem. 
Um, it's called discrete log because, yeah, this is not a logarithm, huh? So initially, <laughs> it was exponentiation, but whatever. Uh, what, what? Oh, wait, I don't want to, okay, so you know like the tabs versus spaces? Yeah, this is the this is the internet fight on ad additive like multiplicative versus additive. Wait, wait, you clearly have an opinion. <laughs> it's like it's, it's, it's the reverse order. It doesn't matter if you if you if you if you write the group operation editor for multiple. Sure, yeah. they're they're equivalent, right? It's just like you press space four times, you press tab. It's equivalent. Um, so initially, this is all just in. Okay, you have G as this regular scalar, and you say. Okay, g to the a equals big A, but it's not on a point anymore. But it's just, so you can do these operations with, with exponentiation where you say, okay, like g to the a to the b equals g to the b to the a, and that's, that's a Diffie-Hellman exchange and stuff. You can do that in this mode as well where you're saying, okay, a times g, uh, wait, what would Diffie-Hellman elliptic curve would be? This point plus, uh, oh yeah, 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 okay, okay. A times BG equals a times B, B times AG. Yeah, so A, B, G, wait. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. No, 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 not the G anymore. Yeah. Now you can write the B as little B, G. Yeah, you don't yeah. have the G because the G is part of the G. G. Small A, big B. Yeah, so, so it would be A times bg is equal to b times ag. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Which is, anyway, these are equivalent, but people argue about it. I am personally more familiar with this because that's just how I learned it, but whatever. Anyway, okay. Um, so, so this is kind of a nice thing where you can, given a scalar and a point, you can jump to another point. Given the, the result, you can't go back. Um, so generally, what we're going to be doing is multiplying things by g. Uh, and then we'll usually say like a here. Um, uh, so, so another way to think of it, these little a's, those are the private keys. And these big a's are the public keys. Right, so a private key is just a random number. You multiply your private key times this point g, and then the outputting point is your public key. Um, it doesn't have to be a public, but you know, the, in, in Bitcoin, that's how it works. Um, so a Schnorr signature, <laughs> uh, this equation, it's not that bad. Should I, should I put the, okay, sorry. Let's say you've got a, uh, your private key is x, and then x times g equals, let's say your public key is p. Um, then you also, when you want to, so you give everyone p. You send bitcoins to the address p, right? It's the hash of this. And then you want to sign. The signature in Schnorr mode, you, when you sign, you also come up with basically another private key. Uh, let's call it little r, and little r times g equals big R. Usually it's k, but I'm going to try to keep it one. Um, and then the signature is s is little r minus the hash of Big R, I'm going to use comma for concatenation. Some people use vertical lines. I don't know. It's easier to draw for me. Uh, so that's your signature. Your signature is S and R. So you compute this S. This is all scalar, right? Basically, this operation is a operation with the point. But this operation is all just scalars, basically. You take the hash of these two things stuck together multiply that hash by your private key, which is, uh, you know, just multiplying to 32, you know, you went to 56s basically. Um, I'll do plus. You're, it's a little faster to, for the verifier if you do minus, but same thing. Easier to think of plus. Um, and so this is the signature. When you want to give someone a signature, you give S and R. And now to verify, um, let's see, I can show that the nice thing about the verification equation is I can't verify that like x was in here. I'm just giving s. I don't know what r is, the little r. But what I can do is I can multiply both sides of this equation by g. So that gives me s times g equals r little r times g plus this hash of big R and m 
times x times g. So dumb question. Yeah. So these s and r mm -hmm. in the big box are yes. uppercase, right? This is lowercase, sorry. Uh, s looks like either way, yeah. yeah. S, s is little. But the, the actual question was, how does that fit in 64 bytes? Because we always assume it's positive or negative? Or? So, yeah. so in ECDSA, we don't, it's like huge. Uh, in 64 bytes, this is 32 bytes, or the S is 32, because it's just a regular scalar. R, you can either do compressed, or I think in the Schnorr BIP, they like force it to be one way or the other. Oh, so it's not even up or down. It's something similar to even and odd, like the compressed you check even and odd. So they don't use even and odd, they use something else similar. Yeah. But then you put just the X, and you say if it's the other thing, then you fail the verification. Yeah. It needs to be the Jacobi simple one, which let's say it's the even one. So it takes some grinding. Uh, yeah, you it can. need to like uh, s uh, subtract by the old L if you get the wrong one. Oh, yeah. so it's not grinding. Just well, it's like a single grind. Half the time you have to grind once, kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, a way to think. Yeah. yeah. So half of the half of the time you just you just restrict it because the because the extra byte would just really be only one bit. So it's like let's just restrict it. Um, but those are like optimizations. You can think of this as 33 bytes. It's probably easier. If you're going to implement it yourself, it's a lot easier to implement it with this is 33 bytes, this is 32 bytes. You know, there's one bit here that tells you plus or minus. Right, right. That's why they're doing it. But yeah, you, you can, anyway. So, so this, this is a nice equation because it's like, hey, um, the signer just computes an addition and a multiplication, you know, a hash and a multiplication and an addition. Then you get this 32 byte thing, you give these both. And then the verifier multiplies s by g. Uh, th what's nice is this, they already know, it's r. This, they already know, that's p. Um, this, they can compute, because they know r. They know the message being signed. Everyone knows g. So the, the verifier has everything. Given this signature, the verifier can reconstruct this whole side of the equation. Um, Multiply the s that they're given by g, see if those two things are the same. If they are, cool, the signature is valid. Um, OK, so this is nice because you can do way more things. Uh, you, can, you can have multi-sig where it's not distinguishable from a single signature. So right now in Bitcoin, if you do like op check multi-sig, you push a bunch of public keys onto the stack, and then you just individually verify a bunch of uh, signatures. That's not great because it takes more space. Um, but in, in this, you could see how, well, if I have, if we can agree on a single R, which is a whole other scenario, but you can see how, well, if I have two signatures on the same message, so I can say I have like S1 equals R plus this hash of R in the message times key X. And then S2 is the same thing uh, times key Y. Um, oh, should I explain? You can add them, but it gets involved because you, you need to do stuff. So there's this whole paper called Musig about this, how you can safely. Uh, you can just add them, but yeah. any, like, this isn't safe anyway. You need to hash also the public key. But well, yeah, you, yeah. you, you got to put P in here. And uh, yeah, so it. Uh, I don't know. I, I, it's a little more to explain. But it, it, it does work. And what's nice is you can create like arbitrary numbers of signatures, uh, ar arbitrary numbers of parties that each have their own private key. And they just sign. And then you add up all the signatures. And it works. Right? The signature is valid for, you know, you're, you're verifying a single S and a single R for all these different pub keys. And you're like, yes, the sum of all these pub keys works. Um, there's a whole bunch of attacks, though. So yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't fully understand. Like, so for music with the, the hash challenge, I saw the cancellation problem. Like, oh, the cancel. Okay, so the cancellation problem was if I if we if we're constructing our private keys, I can make my private key right. My pub my public key is really your public key minus something I know, and so if you add them up, then it, the the sum of the public keys is really just mine. Yeah. So you, no, no, we do. I just, I, it's like it's noon, so I'm like, oh man, if I have to explain, explain all of Musig, 
I'll never get there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you, you, there's, there's a lot of weaknesses in this, which is kind of interesting because none of those were, so like Schnorr Signatures is like 90 something and no one really used it because it was patented. And, but it was sort of seen as like, oh yeah, this is like the simplest, easiest signature thing. But if you ever try to actually use it for multi-signatures, it's like, wait, it's trivially defeatable. So the, the, the thing here is, let's say we want to have two different keys. You know, I have my key A, you have your key B, and we want to make the sum of them key C, and this is what we're going to sign with, right? So this is our two of two multi-sig. The problem is, first, who goes first, right? A, Alice says, okay, here's my key A. And Bob says, oh, here's my key B. What they do is they just, um, they make a re their real key, Q, and they then say, okay, well, B is just A minus Q. Or, yeah. Or Q minus A is easier. Yeah, whatever. It still works. But um, so B is Q minus A. And so now C is A plus uh, Q minus A, which is just. So now Alice is screwed because this two of two point, two of two public key that she thought was both of their keys really is just Bob's key. And so Bob can just do whatever he wants with the money. Um, so there's ways to make it like you delinearize by you say, okay, we're not just going to say A plus B equals C. We're going to define C as, let's say, A times the hash of A and B together plus B times the hash of A and B together. That's real close to okay. It's okay with like two or three keys. Once you get a lot of keys, it's not okay because of um, this, this paper called Wagner's Generalized Birthday Attacks, which is a really scary paper. And if you're thinking of cool math stuff, you should read it because it's like, wait, this, it's, it's like a very general attack that can apply to like lots of different things. Um, so the birthday attack in like hash functions as well, even if it's 256 bits and a pre-image might take me two to the 256 work, finding a collision is only going to take me two to the 128 work. Um, what about finding, and so th this is more general than finding a like two collision where I've tried to find two things that are the same. This is if I have lots of different, you know, there's a hundred different keys and I just want to find something that overlaps, uh, it actually becomes pretty easy. Um, so you actually, what you do is you just put like a, like a one in the, it ends up being something pretty close to like put a zero and then a one. Uh, like you sort of sort them. And end up there. Because I was reading that, that newsletter or email where, you know, with key trees and we're trying to do in and in, in, but we're doing with all the possible combinations of music. Yeah. And for some reason, they, 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 I forget who wrote it, but somebody's wrote, uh, this, this, this becomes impossible. Or this becomes non you said becomes impossible with key. With, with large key trees. And I don't understand why. Uh, wait, so which key tree? Like, there's a... N of M and not M of M? N of M. First of all, N of M in music, you need also Shamil Shik. I understand that, but what I'm trying to say is, like, if I have the leaps in my, in my mass construction, be all N of M, you know what I'm saying? Like, N of M's, but different combinations. Maybe just because there's so many? I, I, I don't, like, I'd have to look, but, like, there are interesting ways to do, the thing is, in real life, you're probably not going to do, like, millions of keys. You're probably going to have, like, five, yeah, uh, in which case you, you can, you can also hand wave away the... This setup and the signing, because in the setup, if you just have, like, two of your own hardware wallets, then you're not worried about this particular attack. But during the signing, one of the wallets might be compromised, so you do want to worry about... Yeah, so, so a lot of times there's like attacks that aren't applicable, but since you're designing a protocol and you want it to be robust against like anything, you, you try to solve the, all these things at once. Um, but yeah, there are ways to sort of share modifications of your private key with other parties so that you can do N of M uh, with, like, with, a, with a setup process. So you, want, you say, okay, we're gonna make a key C that's like the aggregate. We want it two of three signing. With two of three, it's actually really not bad. You're, you're sending one message to the two other people you're dealing with, and then you can reconstruct from any two people. Um, okay, so anyways, I, I'll go to the, the, the idea of an adapter signature, real quick, is a variant of the Schnorr signature, so, which can be used 
in place of HTLC. So I can erase all this. Okay. Um, so the general equation for the Schnorr signature, right? It's S K plus the hash of, and yeah, let's put your public key, your R. So this is little R. Sorry. R R message times your private key. Um, and then for verification, you just multiply all sides by G. So you get SG equals big R, same hash times your public key. Um, with an adapter signature, you add this point, you add this T. So you say, okay, S prime is an adapter signature. I'm going to have T plus R plus the hash of the public key big T plus big R the message times my private key. Um, this is not verifiable as a, you know, if you don't know, like, you're basically just doubling R, right? So you have two of these things. Um, if R is, if little r is known to both parties, then like, learning S will tell you T. So if you learn, if you learn this, you can now learn T, right? So S minus S prime. Okay, wait, sorry. This is, this is not it's okay that you could just <laughs> multiply it, but you need to reveal T, and then you need to multiply T by the big R, and yeah. that yeah. solves the signature. Right. I have R and I have T as points. Yeah. And uh, the two points need to be added, and they need to be one of the hashes, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I know, I, so I know this. Isn't and that then, basically the same as scriptless scripts? Yeah, I mean, the, well, the adapter signature is, I don't know what the two terms, like Andrew Polster yeah, made up both terms. I'm not clear on and what. He also made up sign to contract, which is. Which is like a horrible name for that, because it doesn't, there's no contract involved. Anyway, yeah, uh, names are hard. <laughs> uh, so, so, but if you learn, like the nice thing is if you learn S, you'll learn T and vice versa. So it can have something where revealing a signature now lets you sign the next signature. Um, and so, okay, so the actual, you know, so S minus S basically equals T. Um, so now if I, if I observe this, let's say I know S prime first, if I observe a signature, like the R I already know about, but if I observe this signature S, let's say on the blockchain, I'll learn T. Yeah. I think a T point is missing in the first equation. Wait. In the hash. So S, the first equation that uh, yeah, and sorry, yeah. So, well, yeah. <laughs> We're mod it's sort of, yeah, this is the traditional one. Now it's modified to be for the adapter signature. Then you have this. Let's um, see, public key A. So, like, public key of Alice, public key of Bob. And there's R A and R B. So, they both have their public keys that they already know. They both have their um, nonces points that they already know. Okay, so they agree, so generally the thing in the hash we usually call E, so we say E is the hash of, um, I'm just going to use addition because it's easier, but yes, I, I just explained why this is not safe. Um, let's say PA plus PB. You can't do that unless you've interactively verified, but with RA plus RB plus T M times, okay, well, anyway, that's, that's the, the hash, right? So it's the sum of their public keys, not actually sum, but way simpler to write, um, plus the sum of their nonces, plus this point T that, uh, wait, who makes T? Bob, let's say Bob makes T, so he knows little t. Big T isn't quite the... Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> Similar. It's, it's, well, it, it doesn't quite fill the same function. Um, but anyway, okay. So this is, this is the thing they're going to use as their hash. Um, Bob's adapter signature is now, so Bob knows little t, right? Bob is the one who is essentially, you know, like, on the receiving end. Um, okay, so Bob's got S prime, this is from Bob, is R B plus E, this whole thing, um, plus X. And so, like, 
X, sorry. Alice, Alice knows little r a, obviously, and x a, and Bob knows x b and little r b. x b. Um, OK, so he knows this, and he gives this to Alice, right? So let's say Alice, Bob. So they exchange uh, their p's and r's. And Bob also sends over T. Then Bob computes this and sends over S prime. Alice verifies. So Alice says, OK, is S prime equal to R B plus E plus T B? Um, she can verify that because they agree on E. Alice knows RB, Alice knows PB, she can do this. Um, and then Alice sends hers, which is SA is going to be RA, or sorry. These should be. But anyway, the actual verification is with the big letters, but yeah. So at, when Alice signs, it's going to be little RA plus E plus XA. Now they can combine them. OK, so Bob completes this by, so this, this SA gets sent over. OK, and then Bob completes by saying S sub B equals R sub B plus T plus E plus X B. Um, and then and then T is going to be E is going to equal S tag minus S A minus S prime. So then Alice learns T once. So this, this once the aggregate signature has happened, Alice learns T. Right? So Alice's portion of the signature. Alice, so you know, she, Alice, first Bob sends this S prime thing. This is the adapter signature. Alice verifies the adapter signature. Alice sends her portion of the signature, which is the standard, you know, what she's signing. And then when Bob sends his portion of the signature, now they have S ag, which will be verifiable as any to any third party. Like the blockchain will accept S ag, right? So S prime blockchain won't accept it at all because S prime is the E commits to something completely different than the R and the X part. Wait, sorry. S, S, S B uses the small t. Yeah. The S prime doesn't have t in it, but the S B does. So first, right. So first, Bob says, OK, I'm going to basically this, this message is to prove to you that this is, this is a valid, like, I can do an adapter. You know, here's the adapter signature. Also, you need to know this S prime so that once you see the aggregate signature, um, then you'll learn T. Alice says, OK, everything looks good so far. I'm going to sign my side. Sends over SA, which she, you know, Alice is able to compute. Bob says, OK, to make an aggregate signature that's actually valid according to the blockchain, I need to use T here. Um, so he computes SB. S A plus S B will give S AG, which S AG looks like a valid signature to the rest of the world, right? Once you when you see S AG, it just looks like a regular S and R, you know, regular signature from the sum of their pub keys. And so any script about you know Bitcoin will just say, yep, S AG, that's a signature, cool. Um, the the third parties like the blockchain has no idea 
that any of this has been going on. But once Alice sees SAG, which really Alice computes SAG, right? So really it's once Alice sees SB. Uh, because then Alice, when Alice sees SB, she's like, okay, add my own signature SA to SB, compute SAG, subtract uh, these things from SAG, I'm going to get T. Um, and then I learn T, and then you can feed T into uh, another adapter signature. Um, you construct, so, so this isn't like implemented anywhere, even, even, and, and there's still questions like the timeouts, how do you do, okay, so, but the, the general idea. Alice says, let's add, you know, it's, it's, you're still adding HTLC, you're still adding new outputs to your channel. So you say, okay, in this channel we've got, here's my money, here's your money, uh, let's add this HTLC that's dependent on T. Right, so there is a T. The, the, so the nice thing is, the T is the pre-image. The thing is, you don't see it. Right, so even when the, when the signatures end up on the chain, you're like, oh, I have, so let's make this uh, HTLC-like output, which is spendable by Bob with knowledge of T. Okay, and, and then so in this case, once this transaction if this channel closes and it's on the blockchain and then you see a signature from this, it's an adapter signature, so B learns. Like B was B, well B was A in this, in this write up. And then B learns what little t is. So he's like, cool, now I can take the money from here um, either by dropping onto chain and then signing with B plus the B plus t. You know, B, B's like, cool, I know what little t is, so this is basically my money. But the, once I take it, Alice is going to learn uh, little t because it was this adapter signature construction. Can I ask you a conceptual? So, could you? There's probably a reason why you cannot do this by just tweaking the public keys, right? Yeah, if it's just tweaking the public keys, and then C is the like receiver of the funds. Yeah. C's like, cool. I know what t, C plus t. I can sign with C plus t. I I know little t because I made it up. I'm never going to tell it to anyone, and I know. C, you know, I have the private key for C as well, so this is my money. I'm going to spend it. So when it goes on chain, C can just take it? Yeah, C can just take it, and Bob's like, shoot, there's a signature from this, some, you know, this key, but I don't learn enough from that signature to spend this money. Right? I don't learn little t just from seeing this signature. But if it's an adapter signature, then I do learn little t from that, right? Because they initially did this construction where B, where, in that case, C... Yeah, C knows little t anyway. So why can't he just spend it without it? When they construct, when B adds the HTLC into the channel, they do all this stuff. Right? C, C, uh, sorry, B only adds the, H, the not HTLC, the adapter HTLC thingy um, once C has given this S prime. How many rounds does it put up our prime? Yeah, like the, the, this exchange S prime and, and, and adapter signature. This is Which portion actually goes into the HTLC. Uh, you need to do this to create the HTLC. That doesn't go into the HTLC. This, is exchange between this stuff happens when you sign. No, wait, hold on. Maybe the dotted line is the wrong place. When C wants to spend, he's gonna need. To add the HTLC, the ad, so like if, if we're doing this side, Alice definitely needs S prime first. And then can she safely add? She adds SA. She gives B SA, right? Mm -hmm. And then B computes SB. Give it back to Alice. Mm -hmm. Now Alice adds the adapter signature to the HTLC. No, the signature doesn't, it's only the pub key that's going into the, the HTLC. The signature happens after, right? So the, the signature happens if it gets on chain and B wants to, so I guess B, B receives SA, yeah. To spend to, to like a point, to spend a pub key held by only B. Um, so 
Alice, in order to add the HTLC, needs to get to here. But really, Bob, in order to be OK with the HTLC, needs to get to here. So this C plus T box, that should not be, it's not literally a page of public keys hash of C plus T. It's sweet somehow. No, it can look like just a regular Schnorr signature. Right, just a right, like, so it's, it's just a pub key output. So it's nice. You don't even need taproot. Well, I mean, you need taproot for the time timeout. Um, but the nice thing about this is from the blockchain's perspective, you don't even, like, channels become totally indistinguishable from everything, which is really cool. So, like, right now in Bitcoin, if you say, okay, here's a two of two multisig, it might be a channel. If you close cooperatively, you can't really tell. You never see any of this stuff. Um, whereas in, if you have a Schnorr signature, a two of two multisig looks the same as any other key. Um, so, and also these three outputs, they're all going to look the same, right? Your, your amount, my amount. So even an uncooperative change will just be indistinguishable. So like channels, if you want private channels, you can't see them on chain. Yeah, yeah. then the only case would be linking information with these uh, that are closed by timeouts. Yeah, if you have to use timeouts, then you see the timeouts. Yeah, and then it's like, okay, well, this was probably some kind of channel kind of thing. Um, but in the case where you're not using timeouts, and even if you drop on the chain and you claim with the adapter signature, no one can see that you did it, um, which is nice. Uh, it gets rid of linkability. It also, I think a lot, most of this research was for like Andrew Polster and like Mimble Wimbley stuff, where there can be no scripts, essentially. So like you're forced, everything's forced into just being pub keys and signatures. And it's like, well, we can still do you know, m pretty much the same thing as an HTLC with only using signatures here. Um, at the cost of being kind of more complex. Uh, but, but like on-chain is nice because on-chain is actually smaller. There's no hashes or pre-images floating around. Uh, it just looks like regular signatures, which are pretty small. So anyway, this is not like super uh, in stone, obviously. It's, this is sort of more Here's how we should do it later. Like, because I probably in the next year or so we will have Schnorr signatures in Bitcoin. I don't. I shouldn't say years. So. <laughs> Who knows? But it seems like that's the next thing to do. And like, some people are very pessimistic because Segwit was such a mess. But some people are like, I sort of feel like, well, all the people who hate Segwit left, right? So now they're going to be okay with Schnorr signatures. Uh, <laughs> so, so we might be able to do this. Um, Anyway, so this would be cool to, like, I don't know if, if once Schnorr happens, there's a lot of changes to lightning scripts that can happen. Um, this is one of the big ones. Uh, a magic, right? Okay, so there's, there are papers. So with Schnorr, I'm not saying this is simple, but it's not that bad. Like, once you get all the, once you get it all on paper, you're like, okay. Whereas you can try to do the same thing with ECDSA. And it's a nightmare because you end up, most of the things have like Pallier encryption and like weird. One of the big problems that you try to do is like, how can we turn like multiplication into addition? And like <laughs> crazy, I, I actually uh, was supposed to review a paper on this just two days ago and handed it off to someone else. I'm like, I don't know this math. Like I, maybe one of the other PhD students here can like look at this because I have no, like here's a matrix and here's an inversion and here's like, 30 pages of LaTeX math, and I was like, probably right. I'm not going to review this. <laughs> you don't use ECDSA here. What, what else do you use? I mean, I assume that the small a and big a was using ECDSA. No, no, no. EC, none of this, none of the, I, I never explained the ECDSA equation. The ECDSA equation has like r to the negative one, where you take the multiplicative. Like, there's other stuff, weird stuff in ECDSA. This is all the Schnorr equation. The, the verification of ECDSA looks different. What you mean is that it's still using this like private key and public key, but using a private key as like a scalar and a public key as the element of the so loop. You can use any discrete lock uh, yeah. function. Yeah. Doesn't have to be yeah. That's shared between No, ECDSA is not a, a discrete lock function. ECDSA is just a way of writing these signature verification yeah. equations. Right? So ECDSA needs a discrete lock group, and Schnorr also needs a discrete lock group. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so this relation of getting from small r by group to multiplication to big r, that's the same in ECDSA and in Schnorr. Right? So, so that is, I think, what you refer to as ECDSA, but that's yeah. not ECDSA. ECDSA would be a different equation of this, like s equals r plus hash of big r 
um, types yeah, X, right? Yes, okay. Well, that's Schnorr, sure, actually. Okay. Yeah. I assume that the other thing is also. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so they're, the EC part, the curve is shared between both. The a, a private key, so you could have the same private key, the same public key. Uh, it's just the signature equation only is the difference. If you're interested in it, there's a lot of cool things you can do with these, like with just this sort of discrete log assumption, where hey, I can take scalars, multiply them by a point, and do these things. Um, you can kind of do like everything. Uh, basically, all of the stuff in Bitcoin, Mimblewimble, all these things, it just relies on these two really simple assumptions, which is like, okay, we have hash functions, which you can't pre-image. I don't even think, I don't even think this relies on, on collision resistance, right? Just, just pre-image resistance, I think. Um, but so, you know, you have hash functions where you can't figure out what the pre-image was, and you've got this way to multiply scalars by a point, but you can't go back. Uh, and there's just with those two things, you can make signatures, this crazy stuff, discrete log contracts, uh, bulletproofs, like all sorts of constructions uh, from these two assumptions. So it's pretty, pretty cool. There's also other schemes that get even more complicated that rely on other assumptions, but I like sticking to the, the assumptions because those are also the assumptions that Bitcoin makes, right? Bitcoin assumes that you, know, you can't break SHA-256 and you can't break this SECP curve. If you can break either of those, well, start over. Can you just uh, quickly sum up the advantages of doing this? Okay, so the, the, the high level advantage is right now with regular HTLCs, um, the same hash and the same pre image is used in all of them. So if something, you know, if you're the receiver or if you're C and you see that this channel closes, you're like, oh, that was coming through me. Right, right now with onion routing, you're like, I know who's upstream one, and I know who's downstream one, but other than that, I don't really know where this is going. Um, I don't know if this is the destination even. However, with HTLCs, if something closes on chain, you're like, hey, I know that hash. I've seen that before. That hash is also in my, uh, you know, like if I see this close, and that's also in my uh, channel, like this HTLC is stuck in my channel, and this HTLC is here as well on chain. Like, huh. You don't learn the whole path. You just learn... Okay, this channel, this this H, this payment went through this channel and me as well. I don't necessarily learn that it went through here, um, but you but you do like you do gain more information, right? These these HTLCs are identifiable anywhere. Or if it's like cross chain swaps where you're going through different blockchains, you could say, and then like one of these blockchains doesn't even have channels, and everyone does everything on chain because they're you know Satoshi's vision or whatever. Um, then you would see all the HTLCs and it would be all linkable. So most of the, like HTLCs work on, on chain. You don't have to put them in a channel. It makes sense to, but there are some constructions where you don't put it in channels at all. Um, yeah, certain types of atomic swaps where you're like, I, I'm not gonna bother making a channel because I know I'm gonna just do this one thing once. So I'll do the HTLC just bare on chain. Uh, then it's obvious to everyone. Whereas with adapter signatures, whether it's in channels or directly on chain, um, even if everything is on chain, you can't link these things, right? C knows that, hey, if I see a signature, that'll mean that I can take these coins. Um, but this signature only tells me T, right? The T is the same everywhere, right? But uh, you don't learn it from this signature, right? So B learns T from this signature, A learns T from this signature, but if A observes this signature, A doesn't learn T. Yeah, uh, which is another, I guess, maybe it's an advantage of HTLCs. Like if, you're, if you've got an HTLC stuck in your channel, I guess that is a disadvantage of, of using adapter signatures. If A and B have an HTLC stuck, and then the CD channel closes, and then that payment happens, it reveals the pre-image, and then A, A and B can be like, okay, cool, the pre-image was revealed on chain, let's clear this HTLC out. You wouldn't be able to do that in this case, right? Well, you, you wouldn't be able to skip. You still probably should, right? Because if it, it has to propagate sequentially, which it would anyway, right? Like, I mean, there are, there, you can think of reasons why skipping would be nice, but that seems really unlikely, right? Like, if somehow the B and C are, like, both gone, but then D takes the money, and then now A, well, no, it's still... 
don't know, if it's longer and like something happens here where the money gets taken, but like a bunch of nodes in the middle are down, then these guys would have to wait in, in adapter signatures, but they wouldn't in HTLCs. But that seems like pretty, pretty tiny downside. Uh, that seems very unlikely that you'd ha I guess you'd have to have at least two nodes in the middle that are both dead. One, one, one cool thing about this construction is one advantage is that you can um, basically now add pre-images and add page attaches. Right, because if you have like small two small T's, you can add them. But the corresponding oh. curve point is like big T one and big T two and you it's can add those two. Right, so so you can use this for all kind of escrow magic and escrow payments, um, even though you don't have escrow channels. Right. So so this is pretty cool. So you sort of amp like no, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so the thing is I can now have two people providing a payment hash and the pre which is only the sum of these payment mm -hmm. hashes, and they can oh. actually Provide the sum of the payment hash, and only if the entire chain is set up, they can actually together like work out what is the pre-image. So this is something that we cannot do with hash pre-images, which is really bad, because in this construction we can do much cooler escrow services and mitigate trust and stuff like this. Spontaneous payments too. Wait, sorry. Maybe yeah, you could also use the of the of the version of the I, mean, I, 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 I don't know the pre-image because I know one half of the pre-image, I add the merchant's exactly, ID, and then he can reconstruct the pre-image that I can. That's something like that. I think so. Yeah, I think that, yeah. But yeah, that sounds like. So, yeah, so these are these ideas, exactly. And this you could also do. Yeah, the ability, you know, think of, think of it as like now there's hashes that you can add, and then that, the sum of the hashes is the sum of the pre-image, like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's the base, you know, and you can definitely think of this point multiplication as similar to a hash function, right? So if you're doing A times G to get A, it has many of the same properties. Uh, real high level view here. So if you have a hash of, you know, X, and then you call that Y, and if you have a hash of Q, and you call that P, it is not the case that the hash of X plus Q equals Y plus P. Right. Then, yes, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Definitely not the case. This is. Right. But but if you replace this hash function, and we'll call this function the the point multiplication function, which is just multiplying by g, uh, the if you say m of x is y and m of q is p, it is the case that m of x plus q equals y plus p. This is not a hash function. This is a point, you know, elliptic curve. But, but the entire function. idea of the adapter signatures here was to replace the hash yeah. and the hash time block functions with this construction okay. so that yeah. we can make use of But, but this, is, this is more general in that, like, it does, this is a nice feature. But in, in many other senses, this point multiplication is like a hash function in that it's n not collidable. You know, you can't, you can't find two different scalar, I mean, no, okay, sorry, sorry, no. You can easily find two different scalars that hash to this, that give you the same point, but you just add, and so like, if you, yeah, if you do the modulo first, then you can't find a collision. Although, wait, it, there are no collisions. So that's, it's perfect, it's yeah. a perfect hash function then. Yeah. Right. Way it's way slower. Way, way slower. Couple thousand. Ten thousand, hundred times, thousand times slower, maybe. Um, it's you know you can't you can't go back, so it's one way, like a hash function. There are no collisions. Stronger than a hash function. Uh, so so it's it's kind of cool, but you also have this. Sure, if you're worried about quantum computers, the security. Also, even if you don't, the security is less in that this is 2 to the 256 operations, this is 2 to the 128 operations. Yes. But so this is, this is a nice, you know, this is the property that we use for signatures for everything. And it doesn't have to be uh, elliptic curve multiplication. It can be other things.